That's a human person. And now they're everywhere. We have a deeply skewed idea of what human history looked like, shaped by state propaganda, folk history, works of fiction, capitalist realism, and religion. Grand narratives and great men come together in stories written by victors to craft a tale of linear progress from primitive gatherer hunters to ambitious empires to industrial advancement. The classic story of societal evolution from the supposedly intellectually and culturally inferior to the so-called pinnacle, which always seems to be the society the writers lived in. It's easy to package, easier to digest, and often very difficult to completely uproot. The pernicious influence of our distorted perspective of the past has seemingly paralyzed our ability to be flexible and creative about how we view and shape our present and future. Reality, however, is far more complex and nuanced than we've allowed ourselves to view it as, and history is no exception. Supposedly, as the story goes, for most of our 200,000 years, humans lived in these tiny egalitarian hunter-gatherer bands of 20 to 40 individuals. The world was rough but unspoiled, and we were on the move, foraging and hunting, creating art, telling stories, and working for only a few hours per day. That chill state of human affairs, before classes, castes, and dynasties, had to end eventually, around 10,000 years ago, with the agricultural revolution. We discovered the arduous yet rewarding work of farming, amassed herds, grew fields of crops, accumulated wealth, invented private property, and built cities. Inequality arose because once we had cities and private property, well, naturally, we had to have a centralized government with its bureaucrats, priests, and warlords. Women had to be sequestered to the realm of the domestic, and conflicts with the barbarians in the fringes led to their assimilation, relocation, elimination, or enslavement. Civilization. With all its wars, taxes, slavery, and bureaucracy, but also its literature, science, philosophy, fancy architecture, and video games. Speaking of video games, the narrative is present in all forms of mass media, but especially in the genre of 4X games. From Sid Meier's Civilization series to Amplitude's Humankind, the real human story truly begins with the rise of settled cities and states. Any barbarians left on the map must be completely cleansed, lest they hamper your expansionist ambitions. Truly, a whole video essay could be written about how games perpetuate the logic of imperialism. But I digress. This is the story of the state of nature which Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote about in the 18th century. Essentially, a secular version of the Garden of Eden, a narrative of innocence before the fall. We lost our equality, but at least we got Oreos and Jeopardy. And other stuff too, I guess. British historian Ian Morris's Foragers, Farmers and Fossil Fuels follows his attempt to bring anthropology and economics to dialogue about inequality by establishing a uniform measure of inequality that could be applied across human history. He took the values of Ice Age gatherer hunters and Neolithic farmers and translated them into modern economic speak, looking at their Gini coefficients and formal inequality rates. The Gini coefficient, by the way, is a single number that demonstrates a degree of inequality in a distribution of income and or wealth. It runs from zero, meaning completely equal, to one, meaning completely unequal. Morris divides human history into three big Fs, foragers, farmers, and fossil fuels, and suggests that all societies have an optimal level of social inequality appropriate to where they fall within those three Fs. In forager societies, he assumes that people consume the equivalent of $1.10 per day, per person, with a Gini coefficient of around 0.25 for both income and accumulated wealth. In farmer societies, which includes everything from ancient Rome to Louis XIV's France, to ancient Mesopotamia, people supposedly consumed an average of $1.50 to $2.20 per day per person. These societies had far higher inequality though, with an average Gini coefficient of 0.45 for income inequality and 0.80 for accumulated wealth inequality. In fossil fuel societies, we're supposed to find our optimum level of social inequality. Morris suggests the right level of post-tax income inequality seems to lie between a Gini coefficient of about 0.25 and 0.35, 
and that of wealth inequality between 0.70 and 0.80. You see, we just need to find a reasonable amount of social inequality and everything will be A-OK. -okay. At least, that's one conclusion. American archaeologist Scotty McNish, when asked how we can reach an egalitarian society, replied, put hunters and gatherers in charge. Austrian historian Walter Schneidel concluded in his book The Great Leveler that there's nothing we can do about social inequality other than wholesale catastrophe. That's just civilization for you. When we discuss the problem of social inequality in mainstream politics, the conversation has always been centered around how we approach or don't approach managing it to reasonable levels. Folks say things like 1% of the world controls nearly 50% of the wealth, they notice that levels of social inequality have been bonkers lately, and they've been demanding that something be done about it. Tax the rich. I mean, the exploitative circumstances by which they become rich will still exist, but tax their wealth more. A lot of people want to move towards a more equal society, but more or less are relative. And the built-in assumption is that as long as we live in an urban, technological society, we just have to accept some level of inequality as a feature, not a bug. The central questions for progressives become, how do we most efficiently and effectively manage the amount of power wealthy people have over their peons? And how do we meet the needs of those in the bottom rungs? In other words, how do we adjust the size of the boots that will be stomping on all our faces forever? Because there will always be rulers and ruled, right? I mean, otherwise, do we just go back to living in forager bands, all for the sake of equality? Do you see the problem? The conversation is limited by our perception of our potential. Real social transformation, an end to the exploitation of the masses, is basically off the table. Our historical narrative sets the stage for our modern political possibilities. We either get civilization and its inherent inequality, with some tweaks and reforms here and there, some imagined industrial equivalent to the primitive utopia we left behind, or a forcible return to hunter-gathering lifestyle. A neo-neolithic, if you will. But the common historical narrative simply isn't true. In fact, overwhelming archaeological and anthropological evidence contradicts that conventional tale. We didn't spend most of our history in tiny bands. Agriculture was not some irreversible threshold of progress and inequality, and our first cities were often quite egalitarian. So let's begin by deconstructing these conceptual shackles and taking a closer look at what's really been happening in human history. Francis Fukuyama's The Origins of Political Order and Jared Diamond's World Until Yesterday posit a history where humans lived equally, simply, and meagerly. But naturally and inevitably, bureaucratic centralized states would emerge with the development of agriculture. Why? Because with agriculture comes food surplus and population booms. With large populations comes chiefs who become kings, who become emperors. Resistance to that point is basically futile. As Diamond writes, large populations can't function without leaders who make the decisions, executives who carry out the decisions, and bureaucrats who administer the decisions and laws. Sorry, Anarchides, but is that true though? Diamond may be a smug, part-time distortionist of human history, but is he right this time? Nah, <laughs> he's wrong actually. In fact, it's pretty common for these sort of folks to state their prejudices as facts. But there's no evidence pointing to the inevitability of small societies being egalitarian and large societies being authoritarian. Part of the problem here is this big picture approach to prehistory. It's almost never grounded in actual evidence. For example, in the creation of inequality, Kent Flannery and Joyce Marcus proposed that the invention of farming led to the emergence of demographically extended clans and, as it did so, access to spirits and the dead became a route to earthly power. Then the especially talented healers or warriors would give their status to their descendants, whether they deserved it or not, and boom, chiefdoms rose, sowing the seeds for the inevitable everything else. Sources? Do trust me. They don't bring actual archaeological evidence until after the birth of states and empires. Their story of the creation of inequality comes from descriptions of modern, small-scale foragers, herders, and cultivators in parts of Africa and South America. The problem is, these people are not living fossils. The assumption that they are is one that has its roots in a legacy of white supremacy. In his 1798 essay on the principle of population, Thomas Malthus invoked the indigenous peoples of North America 
to help illustrate his model of human progress, from hunting to pastoralism to agriculture to further development. This is part of his whole debunked narrative of population growth leading to humanity's doom. But like far too many modern observers, he believed that the most effective way to access the early history of human society was to study the contemporary people he judged to be primitive. Rousseau himself illustrated his thought experiment with comparisons between the historical savage of prehistory and the modern savage of the Caribbean, who was still in his state of nature and therefore unburdened by the responsibilities of the civilized man. Even Marxists have fallen into this trap, generating their own version of the linear, Eurocentric model of social evolution in stages, with a grand narrative of humanity that begins with primitive communism and is destined to end with a renewed iteration of it. But the people that these political theorists have looked to as evidence for their theories of human progress are not naive or primitive. They're not a window into humanity's past. They're not stuck in the early stages. Like I said, they're not living fossils. They have been around for thousands of years, interacting with agrarian states, empires, readers, and traders. They are conscious shapers of their own lifestyles and societies, based on their own histories and experiences. Only archaeology can tell us what, if anything, they have in common with prehistoric societies, not our preconceived biases. But before we can uproot the assumption that agriculture is inevitably linked to the rise of all states, we must interrogate the assumption that agriculture was an absolute upgrade in all respects. In Against the Grain, James C. E. Scott uncovered osteological analysis that demonstrated that sedentary lifestyle, with domesticated animals and plants, led to a significant decrease in health and well-being due to zoonotic diseases, a less diverse staple diet, and greater hours of toil. Scott also discovered that there was a several thousand year gap between the emergence of sedentary farming communities in the Fertile Crescent and the development of the earlier city-states in the same region. And the rise of states wasn't really an upgrade either. Slavery, taxation, and war would exact immense suffering on the populace wherever states would arise. And for most, collapse was the best thing a state could do. But then we have to dig even deeper and question how we're defining agriculture here. See, for a long time, it was believed by European scholars that indigenous peoples in Australia and Melanesia didn't practice agriculture. The imperialist mindset was that European agriculture naturally replaced the savage, lawless, and violent world of hunter-gatherers with monoculture, the origin and guarantor of the settled life, of formal religion, of society, and of government by laws. Anyone who didn't adopt that method was clearly either ignorant or stagnant. That mindset, that assumption, persisted because Aboriginal agricultural practices weren't exactly like the farming practices of the Europeans that studied them, so they didn't recognize them as such. But the Aboriginal people planted and harvested crops, managed irrigation systems, and cleared cropland with controlled burning. It wasn't a virginal outback, untouched by man. It was a well cult. <laughs> It was a well cultivated human <laughs> It was a well cultivated human shaped environment. Archaeological evidence indicates that these practices have been ongoing since humans first settled in Australia thousands of years ago. Grain based monoculture is only one form that agriculture can take. It's a form that was prevalent in parts of Eurasia, but other forms of agriculture, like garden agriculture, were extremely successful in other parts of the world. Rousseau's thought experiment fits neatly in the legacy of imperialist European societies viewing other peoples in Asia, Africa, the Pacific, and the Americas as less developed, and thus ripe for exploitation and domination. Rousseau's white supremacy, wrapped up in the so-called rational bow of the Western canon, continues to shape common and even academic perceptions of history today. But what has actual archaeological and anthropological research really taught us about early human life since the time of Rousseau. Let's start by breaking down how archaeologists divvy up the human record. Homo species first appeared roughly 2 million years ago, with Homo habilis, sparking the Old Stone Age, also known as the Lower Paleolithic. Homo sapiens wouldn't show up until around 300,000 to 200,000 years ago, in the Middle Paleolithic which lasted until about 50,000 years ago. By the Upper Paleolithic, we'd peopled every planet, reaching the south of South America by roughly 15,000 years ago. 
That's where most of our information about prehistoric human social life begins. The Upper Paleolithic, that is. Before then, we really have little clue. The Upper Paleolithic marks the peak of the last Great Ice Age, before the Cash Grabby sequels. With our new, warm conditions, our current geological epoch began. The Holocene. Keep in mind that, due to the historical distribution of archaeological study, most of our evidence comes from Eurasia, and particularly Europe, so these divisions don't apply one-to-one -one with the rest of the world's archaeological record, at least as far as we know so far. Europe isn't some extra special magical place, it's just where most of our evidence comes from for now. Let's get a picture of the Paleolithic in Europe. It's the Ice Age, but the habitable bits of Europe were as lush as the Serengeti. Between the tundra of northern Europe and the forested shorelines of the Mediterranean, rich valleys and steppes traversed by deer, bison and mammoth sustain a human life quite unlike the blissfully simple picture we envision. East of Moscow, in Sankir, we found one of many rich burials in the era. 25,000 years ago, a middle-aged man was buried with honor. Bracelets of polished mammoth ivory, a diadem or cap of fox's teeth, and nearly 3,000 laboriously carved and polished ivory beads. The man's drip was immaculate. A few feet away, in an identical grave, two children were laid to rest, of about 10 and 13 respectively, adorned with comparable grave gifts, including a massive lance carved from ivory. Similarly, rich burials like these can be found from rock shelters to open-air settlements, from what is now southwest France to northeast Spain to northwest Italy to southwest Russia. If rich burials weren't enough, we've also found sporadic but compelling evidence for relatively monumental architecture in the era too. They weren't building massive pyramids or anything, but by the standards of the time, they were probably pretty impressive public works. Picture the frames of impressive mammoth houses we found in modern-day Poland and Ukraine from 15,000 years ago. Or consider the heavy limestone temples adorned with carved artwork excavated on the modern Turkish-Syria border, built 6,000 years before Stone Age. Were these Paleolithic kings and queens living in luxurious temples and adorned in burial? Do we just abandon the notion of an egalitarian human history entirely? Well, no. The evidence for institutional inequality is itself pretty sporadic. Grand burials appear centuries and hundreds of kilometers apart, and there's no evidence that these Ice Age princes acted like how we'd expect princes to act, with fortifications, storehouses, palaces, or really anything that would indicate ranked society. In fact, over tens of thousands of years, this sporadic evidence points in a different direction, with most of these burials consisting of physically anomalous individuals like giants, hunchbacks, or dwarves. Plus, we need to consider how people lived at this time, because it doesn't paint a picture of sustained social inequality. When Ian Morris calculated a Paleolithic income of $1.10 a day, seemingly derived from the caloric value of daily food intake in 1990, he failed to consider all aspects of Paleolithic society. All modern incomes may be higher, but what are we paying for that they wouldn't have to pay for? First of all, organic free-range produce and natural spring water, but also free security, free dispute resolution, free primary education, free skillshare premium, free elderly care, free medicine, free housing, free fur coats, and free entertainment, including music, storytelling, and religious services. There's a reason Marshall Salins calls them the original affluent society. And as for the massive structures we found, rather than pointing to a grand, lasting social order, the evidence instead tells us they were not buildings meant to last. Rather, each structure lasted until a great feast, where they would be torn down again. A cycle of building, feasting, and destruction, maintained by hunter-gatherers. There was a rhythm to their life, one that lay in the seasons. The seasonal rhythms of prehistoric social life are indicating the evidence for annual or biennial periods of aggregation, where various groups of people would come together for hunting parties of game hoods, fish runs, and nut harvests. At micro-cities like Dolnivestonis in the Moravian Basin south of Brno, they congregated en masse, 
feasting on a superabundance of wild resources, engaging in complex rituals, creating ambitious artistic enterprises, and trading minerals, marine shells, and animal pelts over striking distances. Even after agriculture gained greater prominence, such seasonal patterns still endured. Stonehenge was only one of many ritual structures, of timber and stone, where people congregated and dispersed from during the Neolithic. In the British Isles, while the cycle of erecting and dismantling grand monuments endured well into the Neolithic, the people made a decision in striking contradiction with the contemporary linear narrative. In 3300 BCE, after they adopted the continental farming economy, they let go of one crucial aspect of it, keeping cattle herding but abandoning cereal farming, instead adopting hazelnut collection as a staple food source. They existed in the limbo between foragers and farmers. What these seasonal variations and lifestyle fluctuations show is that prehistoric humans, just as intelligent as modern humans, were self-consciously experimenting with different social possibilities. Anthropologists have dubbed these societies, past and present, as possessing a double morphology. One such society was described by French sociologist Marcel Mauss in the early 20th century. The Circumpolar Inuit had two social structures, one in summer and one in winter, and that in parallel they had two systems of law and religion. In the summer months, Inuit dispersed into small patriarchal bands in pursuit of freshwater fish, caribou, and reindeer, each under the authority of a single male leader who possessively marked property and exercised coercive power over his skin. However, during the winter months, when seals and walruses flocked to the Arctic shore, a different social system took charge. Wealth and partners were shared in common, as Inuit gathered together to build great meeting houses of food, wheel rib, and stone, where the virtues of equality, altruism, and collective life prevailed. A similar double morphology can be found on Canada's northwest coast where indigenous hunter-gatherers alternated between aristocracy and slavery in the winter and more informal clan structures in the summer. In the American Great Plains, nomadic Cheyenne and Lakota bands, who at one point did try out farming, congregated in large settlements to make logistical preparations for the buffalo hunt. In this sensitive period, they adopted a seasonal, temporary authoritarian police force with the coercive power to imprison whip or fine any offender who endangered the proceedings. But once hunting season was over, they returned to more anarchic forms of organization. The linear conception of social evolutionary stages, like from bands to tribes to chiefdoms to states, can't reasonably be applied to these societies. I mean, are they electric sliding forward and moonwalking backward in their evolution every year? Most anthropologists can now recognize that these categories can be pretty useless when it comes to describing the broad variety of human life. Archaeological evidence points to similar seasonal practices taking place in the last ice age, with more libertarian and more authoritarian social relations and structures rising and falling through the air. They seem to recognize that no particular social order was ever fixed or immutable, and with that flexibility comes the ability to step outside the boundaries of one's given social structure and reflect, making and unmaking one's political reality. We have a tendency, as humans, to look to our past in order to figure out where we should go in our future. Consciously or unconsciously, we're impacted by the narratives we're told about what humans are and can be. We must recognize that there is so much left to be told about our species' long history, a drama of tens of thousands of years. We will need to shed our prior assumptions about whether humans are fundamentally anything, whether good or evil, competitive or cooperative, egalitarian or hierarchical. Our ancestors for our intellectual peers, not half apes whose primordial innocence had not yet been violated by the Pandora's box of inequality. They took part in a theater of pioneers who explored the planet and themselves with a variety of social arrangements and experiments. 
So we must ask ourselves, why, after spending so much of our history experimenting, do we get stuck in the chains of our present rigid political order? We must interrogate the baseless and biased assumptions of many political theorists that complex society requires authoritarian rule in some form. And we must ask, what other treasured beliefs and common sense narratives must we also discard in our quest for truth? First of all, there's no longer any support for the view that the origins and spread of agriculture marked a major transition in human societies. In the parts of the world where animals and plants were first domesticated, there was really no discernible switch from Paleolithic farmer to Neolithic farmer. The transition from life based mainly on wild resources to life based mainly on cultivation took something like 3,000 years. And while agriculture did make unequal concentrations of wealth more possible, that's not what happened every time, or even most times, it was developed. At least, not for a solid millennia later. From the Amazon to the Middle East, different peoples were trying farming, mixing it into their annual modes of production and social structures. Sometimes, farming even failed, leaving only resilient foragers in its wake. Considering the length and variety of the transition, it makes little sense to point to the agricultural revolution as some sort of switch from an egalitarian to a hierarchical society. Some foragers were highly stratified, and many early farmers developed societies even more egalitarian than their forager neighbors, with an increase in the economic and social importance of women reflected in their art. And what about civilization and cities? Are they inseparable? A package deal? Not quite. The world's first cities didn't all pop up with centralized authoritarian government, literate administration, and the whole shebang once thought necessary for their foundation. Long before the rise of China's earliest royal dynasty, we know of cities as large as at least three square kilometers on the lower reaches of the Yellow River. In the valleys of Peru, Sunken plazas indicate a city four millennia older than the Inca Empire. In Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, and the Basin of Mexico, there's mountain evidence that the first cities were organized on self-consciously egalitarian lines, with significantly autonomous municipal councils, no trace of royal burials or monuments, no standing armies, and no hint of direct bureaucratic control. There's no evidence that top-down structures of rule are necessary for large-scale social organization, nor is there evidence that such structures of rule can only be dismantled by general catastrophe. For example, the city of Teotihuacan in Mexico, with a population of 120,000 in the year 200 CE, transformed itself from a city of pyramid temples and human sacrifice to a city run by frequently whipped municipal councils and similarly sized comfortable villas for the entire population. While people may insist that participatory democracy, whether direct or consensus-based, can only work in small groups and can't scale up to the size of a city, region, or country, the evidence suggests the opposite, with the rather common occurrence of egalitarian cities and regional confederacies. However, what isn't so common in human history is the egalitarian family. In fact, some of the most painful losses of human freedoms began at the small scale, at the level of gender relations, age groups, and domestic servitude. Relationships that can contain both the greatest intimacy and the deepest forms of structural violence. It may be true that inequality began at home. And so home may be the place where our most difficult work for social transformation may take place. As information pours in from every quarter of the globe, based on careful empirical fieldwork, advanced techniques of climatic reconstruction, chronometric dating, and scientific analyses of organic remains, we're beginning to examine ethnographic and historical material in a new light. A body of research has been and continues to be built that clashes against the familiar narrative and forces us to rethink human history. If we can let go of our prejudices and engage with history's rich complexities, we can see the implications of what's really there. 
The role of revolutionaries should be as the imagination movers of society, linking past, present and future to generate and power creative and uplifting revolutionary movements that can shape society for the better. The Zapatistas of Chiapas and the Democratic Confederalists of Northeast Syria understand that freedom, tradition and the imagination have always and will always be entangled in ways we don't completely understand. And it's time to catch up. It's time to imagine. There's so much we don't yet know. There's so many things that we'll never truly know. But the unknowability of our whole past doesn't cut off the possibilities of our future. In fact, in some respects, it may free us to think anew. What we already know so far only demonstrates that so much more is possible. There is nothing irreversible or inherent about our contemporary condition. We can fight back. Peace. This video was inspired by and mostly based on a 2018 article in Eurozine by British anthropologist David Graeber, who is now unfortunately deceased, and David Wengrew. Their new book, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity, is set to release on Tuesday, October 19th, 2021. Order a copy today. I wasn't sponsored or anything, but Wengrew is free to send me a free signed copy if you'd like. Wink, wink, hint, hint. <laughs> I just think it's an important book, and I myself am looking forward to delving into all 704 pages. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow peoples. Thanks once again, of course, to the family, including our newest members Zane, Hector Laveau, Ishmael Bugwa, Tara Dawson, Tiffany Bennett, Joe Hines, Punky, M, and Brad Hunt. If you can, join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash true. Check out all my other videos for a range of radical topics. Follow me on Twitter at underscore true. Thanks again. Peace.